Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. It's Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Such was here. Happy International Podcast Day. I don't know if you knew that or not, Vita. I had no idea. Happy International Podcast Day, John. Well, it's a pleasure having you on uh, today's program. Vita Ayala, everybody. I've been looking forward to a nice uh, talk with you since uh, you uh, came on uh, John Con a few weeks ago. That was the first time I got to meet you, and you cracked me up. So oh, it's uh, good to talk to you. It's great to talk to you. I'm a big fan of your show, and and that was just such a great time. Uh, I feel I feel like I was a little behind because I hadn't known that I was supposed to have like a drink beforehand. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still I'm still dry right now. I'm just drinking seltzer right now. I, I got water and <laughs> coffee uh, sitting by me, so I can appreciate that absolutely. Hey, I'm sorry that uh, your wife is under the weather. Oh, it's all right. I just uh, of course. When you have to go live, that's exactly when the cats have to be fed and the dogs have to this and like. So how many animals? We personally have just two cats, just two. It's enough. Uh, but my, uh, we live in a very small apartment. It's like a we're doing like an isolation pod, so there's seven of us in the pod. And wow. Upstairs neighbors, yeah, we have three apartments total, and we're all very good friends. And so the upstairs neighbors are not in the house right this second. And they okay. have two delightful dogs, absolutely wow. adorable. But I was like, oh, like I have to make sure that they have water and like blah, blah, blah. So yeah. anyway, sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's all good. How, uh, how are you coping with everything uh, COVID wise and all? Well, uh, you know, I'm very lucky in that, uh, you know, my isolation pod is healthy. Uh, my immediate family is healthy that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I know people that have had it, but everyone so far has, you know, uh, come through it. Okay. Which is really great. My nephew, my baby nephew had it, uh, at the beginning, but oh, he wow. came through it and he's, he's doing absolutely great. So that's great to hear. No, I hear you. I haven't had any one in my immediate family, but lots of friends and yeah. older relatives of theirs and, and stuff and, and, you know, mo mothers of friends and stuff. So yeah, it's, uh, it is but what it is, sadly. It is but. exactly. But I'm just happy that, you know, I can't say happy. I'm I'm glad that the people that I know that have had it have have come through okay. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's terrific. Hey, congratulations on uh the big splash you've made with uh, your writing. <laughs> and I'm I'm really glad that uh Marvel and DC are finding things uh for you to do. Oh they're um, they're great. Uh thank you so much. I cannot believe uh what a what a strangely uh, good year professionally I've had. <laughs> hey, no, and especially, again, during these very weird times. So uh, I'm glad your word is getting out there. And, um, no, it's a pleasure to read your stuff. I, uh, I you know, I, I want to ask about um, Black, Mast in, Black Mask in particular, who uh, put out the the, the Wilds. Um, and we'll get to the prophetic nature of the Wilds. Good Lord. Oh, no. <laughs> you know, I don't know what tea leaves you're reading, but you're obviously on the right track given where we are today. <laughs> too prescient <laughs> yes but before that um you know honestly shame on me i I've, i i came late to black mass and i'm really blown away by oh, the amount of great library yeah i mean yeah. i knew about you know uh like matthew uh, and and four kids walk into a bank and and a couple of the other things but truly every time i'm i'm given a black mask book it's like wow here's another really cool book 
by very cool people. So how did you hook up with them? So I, I used to work at Forbidden Planet in New York with Matt Rosenberg. Uh, he's oh, no kidding. Friends. Yeah. Um, a lot of the people that were working around the time that we were working together have ended up in comics, which is really great. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, I met uh, I, I met the the publisher through him. Uh, they are very good friends. And so, you know, I was lucky enough to be able to just like hang out and talk with them like people. <laughs> um, and then, of course, uh, Matt is one of my biggest supporters and he's always pushing me to pitch and to not be afraid and all that stuff. And so he was like, you know, I'll vouch for you because I believe in your stuff. And I pitched to Black Mask and they liked the concept. And uh, we accidentally predicted what was going on. So uh, look yeah. out for those plant zombies soon, I guess. Yeah, exactly, man. No, the <laughs> wilds has a, has a pandemic uh, because of the pandemic governments kind of collapse and uh, you've got these subsidies uh, all in existence. And, um, and also of course the post office fails. So your, your protagonist <laughs> is, is a, is a courier. So that I, was yeah. also like, I remember thinking when I was, you know, me and, and Emily Pearson, uh, my co-creator were talking about everything. And I was like, yeah. this is the thing that makes the most sense. To, like 10 years down the road, I want to know what the post office looks like. <laughs> I want to know what it's like to to trade between little enclaves right because you think about the way that communities kind of develop in isolation it's like well somebody has to be the go between because otherwise there's no story so right 100% no and uh you know it, it's a it's a flawed movie but i have to confess uh the kevin costner postman movie I has was... always <laughs> talk so to funny. me i love it i love it i remember i i mean i was a kid when it came yeah. out i don't even remember when it came out i watched it on vhs but I remember being super <laughs> fascinated with that idea. Like, yes, it is a flawed movie. Absolutely. That's true. But I remember just being like, yes, but like, what was it like? And what will it be like? Like, I remember too, growing up, uh, I uh, was born and bred in New York City, um, the Lower East Side. And um, when I was a kid, the block that I lived on had like, in my mind, I was like, if we were to separate from the rest of the world, like, it, we'd be fine because I didn't understand how things worked, right? But we had like a supermarket and like a couple of restaurants. We had a big post office, like all this stuff. And I was like, yeah, like our block could survive anything. And now that it's happening, I'm like, that's not how it works. <laughs> that's not how it works at all. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, you know, I mean, how how weird and different is life during COVID as far as New York City? Because I'm in Chicago, big city, you know, but I, but I am in one of the more neighborhoody kind of parts of Chicago rather than what I've experienced in New York, staying with my friends or staying even in, you know, some of the hotels. Yeah. I mean, like you say, it really is this little microcosm of bodega, cleaner, fast food, good restaurants, all literally on the same block. I mean, we're, we're really lucky that way. Even in my neighborhood in Brooklyn, um, I'm in Brooklyn now. In okay. Okay. Uh, you know, like there's there's a bodega on like three or four corners and like all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, like like I don't venture farther than like two blocks unless I have to. Like, yeah. I mean, there's a there are a couple of supermarkets that are pretty close by, luckily. But like, I feel like you know, like I mask up and I have like my hair like in a hat and like I'm like covered head to toe. And then I come home and I you know I throw off all my clothes and I burn them. And no, I'm just kidding, I don't burn them, but <laughs> like I. <laughs> I'm one of those people. Uh, I immediately am like, our outside clothes are for outside now, and we got to, you know, decontaminate. Like we're in some sort of sci-fi movie in space. Like I, <laughs> I'm, I'm wild. So, um, but it's, it, you know, I, I find it interesting. Uh, my mom lives in Manhattan still, okay. in the Lower East Side, and I, they've been isolating as well um and so i you know i go and i visit her every couple of weeks just to make sure everything's you know okay she doesn't get too bored and i'm like even that's too busy for me now like i've turned into a person who can't i'm like oh no there are people and i grew up here like i, <laughs> I love people no, but yeah no i get it honestly i we, i moved back to the city about four or five years ago and i was really glad to do it because i do i love i love the urban feel and now we got to be afraid you know, it's, it's, or you know what I mean? Or at least be it's prepared wild. and be careful. 
Yeah, exactly. I, you know, it's gotten to the point um, where I'll watch a movie like from the before time. It is now a before and after time. <laughs> and no one's wearing a mask. And I'm like, mm -mm, no, this doesn't feel right. Put on a mask. I'm like, Titanic, put on a mask. I, mm -mm. I hear you. I'm DVRing uh, South Park tonight because, as always, South Park is like, Always as as up to date Very as you can be. Yeah, I was gonna say. So I'm really excited to kind of watch uh, the season premiere tonight and see how they're handling things. And I'm sure it's going to be, you know, sadly hilarious. But uh, yeah, you know, isn't it fascinating? Um, I I don't know. And again, now you, writing the wilds and stuff. Um, I I don't. I hope that we don't get a lot of life during COVID fiction out of this but you know it's kind of like i felt that way and and you'll forgive me vita because I'm, I'm in chicago but i did do a lot of work on 9 11 yes. supporting a couple of new york radio stations and every time there's a, like a dramatization of 9 11 i'm always like i don't want to live that again you know yeah i same um yeah. i think that there are some things that have dealt with it in a very like respectful and, and kind way and i am like that, I totally get. But even those, I'm like, I don't know if I can watch that. Like, I don't know if I'm I hip. can yeah. be in it again. Um, yeah. So I totally, yeah. I hope that if we do get COVID era fiction, it's not, it's not the COVID, like overtly that is the subject. Like, I would be interested in like horror fiction that, like, in this time, like, because that's that's an extra stressful layer, right? Like, what, sure. what would a haunted house story look like now, or like a slasher movie? Like, you know what I mean? But like, I do. Yeah, not like, you know, the actual subject. Let's be yeah. a little more. <laughs> little you know, more escapism. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But I hear what you're saying from a horror standpoint, and I think that's that is interesting. And um, I, uh, I, I, were you? During this period, how's your creativity been? Have you been able to? Are you, you know, content with your your storytelling? Are you are you okay? I mean, or has it paralyzed you? I mean, people are going through that. I mean, it's hard because on the one hand, I I always have a ton of ideas. Just every day, I have new ideas. Um, so I I'm not suffering from lack of ideas. But the being able to get into the headspace where I'm productive um, is difficult. Um, I have a lot of support, and I have. I have a small writing like chat that I'm in. Uh, it's just Teeny Howard and Leah Williams and me. Oh, that's great. <laughs> the two loves of my life. Uh, and I, we, we like gas each other up. We help each other get through it because that's it, cool. It, it can be really difficult. And um, I know there are some people that are like able to just do what they're doing. Uh, you know, I listen to your show all the time. So I'm, oh, I'm always like, who, who's be, who's able to do it? And what are they doing? Like, how am I yeah. like Ed Brubaker? Tell me how to do it. Like, I don't, but you know, I, in my own broadcast way, honestly, Vita, I, I can relate. And truly, uh, luckily, you know, it occurred to me to start doing video and really I was it, say it's really, it's great. It's actually really lovely. <laughs> so thank, thank you. you. No, it's my pleasure truly. And you know, again, Glad we're doing this on International Podcast Day and uh, yeah. look forward to releasing the audio in a, in a day or two. Um, God, you mentioned Teeny. Teeny's another person that uh, I got I to gotta touch base with again and uh, get her on and uh, do the same thing because, no, I, I love her writing. I, I think she's terrific. She's and I'm really fun. happy, again, that doors are opening up for, for, for Teeny as well. I, you know? I'm one of her biggest fans. Uh, her and Leah have really – and, of course, I have other friends that you wouldn't necessarily know that I should – probably like you know pimp on your show because they're wonderful but like there's a group of people that have really gotten me through this that like we're all just going through the same struggle and so you know it's we know how to support each other um which is really nice Regine Sawyer I don't know if you know Regine I, I'm aware of the name I haven't met her yet I haven't read I haven't read her stuff she's uh, but great. she's great and you two would have a time <laughs> that's good to know um so yeah Regine Sawyer and Che Grayson are two others who we have our own little you know, writing chat that gets me through the day. So that's um, outstanding. That's terrific. Uh, I'm going to check the uh, chat here to see if there are any yeah. new questions. Um, oh, let's see. Did I already show this one? I don't think I did. Uh, so glad I jumped in live. This is Ryan O'Connell. Big fan of yours. And John, thank you, Ryan. Uh, to me, some of your strengths are in dialect and dialogue. Is that something you've worked on or just a gut thing? You write teens so well. Oh, Oh, well, thank you. Uh, I try and say stuff out loud as I write it. Uh, and I try, I'm really lucky in that I've been able to meet a, a wide variety of different kinds of people. Um, living in New York City, I worked in retail for 10 years. Like 
Um, when I went to college, I worked in, you know, public facing uh, areas, many of them and many jobs. Um, okay. And so I try and channel the people that I've heard. Um, and I've been told that because I'm a Pisces, I'm a chameleon. And so I try <laughs> to use that as much as possible. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you. I really appreciate that. Uh, writing teens is something that brings me a lot of joy. Um, so that feels really nice. Well, it's going to be fun, and we're going to talk about uh, your upcoming run on New Mutants because uh, so, that's that's going to be pretty cool. And I know there's some questions regarding that as well. Uh, Jessica Ashcroft, Vita, big fan, came to you through uh, Xena stuff. Awesome. awesome. <laughs> Curious what that experience was like working on something not big too superhero and not an original, where you uh, where you have more control of characters. It was it was wild. Uh, so I'm like Zena's like my number one favorite character of all time. Like I could quote, I could start at the first episode and just quote the series like forever. Um, and so to be able to go and work on anything related was was intense. But the thing that I I was really surprised at was that I did have a lot of control. Um, you know, at first my editor was like, "Okay, like you're gonna have to," and I was like, "Oh no, I'm ready." Like. Any any questions that that need answering, I got this. Um, and I kind of showed very early on that I knew the subject matter well enough that I wouldn't necessarily do things that didn't make sense for the character. And we got like no notes from from the licensor. They were just like, all right, <laughs> like, that's whatever. cool. No, that's true. That's always the best situation. So was that for Dynamite? Who who was printing Xena? Yeah, that was for Dynamite. Um, and I, I worked with a bunch of artists on that, and it was incredible like every single one of them was absolutely stellar and dynamite dynamite um and they they all were super big xena fans too so we all just kind of geeked out about it <laughs> um so yeah that was also one where i i there were things that i didn't think i'd get away with and then they were like yeah you can just do that i was like you know she's gay right and they were like yeah that's fine i was like great all right i didn't make it up <laughs> so here we are that's outstanding. John Shulian, the guy who uh, created Xena, old Chicago sports reporter prior to being a television writer. And uh, yeah, and I really admired uh, both uh, both careers. And, uh, you know, he's an, he was an old boxing writer. I'm a big boxing guy. I know you're a big wrestling person. I am a wrestling person. I, I like Nothing boxing. Nothing wrong with that. Do you oh, really? Yeah. I do. I well, we're gonna have I, to talk I, boxing at some at, 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 during this conversation at some I'm point. I'm not as, as up on things as like you know Steve Orlando would be another person who I love. <laughs> on my head. I just talked to Steve yesterday. <laughs> He's the best. Um, but to me, like I love the mental game that goes with boxing, and I get a little squeamish because I know they're actually hurting each other. With wrestling, I'm like, yes, they get hurt, but like only when they mess it up. Like, right. Hurt with boxing, I'm like, oh, the whole point is you're actually punching each other, but like, look at the strategy. Like, oh my god. So, so I'm I'm not as cool as as you and Steve. But oh, stop. <laughs> I enjoy no, it. that's no, that was and honestly, I'm glad you you see the the mental game that goes on. Oh, and that's more than half the battle right there. I, and I'm sure not the first person to say You know, I, I covered boxing for 16 years in broadcast and print. And I used to always say it's physical chess. Yes, you know? exactly. That's such a great – I've never actually heard that before, but that's a great way to describe it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, I mean, and really a lot of times it is the mental game. And, you know, guys like Roy Jones back in the 90s and 2000, early 2000s, just watching him dismantle. One of the best fights I ever saw, and I was really bummed that the rematch took so long to happen – was Roy Jones and Bernard Hopkins. Because oh, when man. they first fought, it was defense and hit and not be hit. And it was so great to watch. And then by the time they did fight each other, you know, all their physical talents were gone. So all they could do was slug each other, you know? <laughs> but you know what? It's like with that kind of like waiting, it's almost still worth it. You're just like, yeah. <laughs> I just, I just want to see it happen. I don't know. As, as like a big wrestling person too, like a lot of my, the wrestlers I grew up with are, they're not too old. They're still in the ring, but you know, okay. they're not as fast as some of the younger people. And so sometimes sure. you're just like, just put, just put two of the, put two of the classics together and just let them go. I know it's not going to be the same as now, but I don't care. Like, I just want to see like legends go at it. Like, well, and I've, I've been so pleased to see so many wrestlers turn into really good actors. And I oh, mean, yeah, Dwayne, yeah. Dwayne Johnson is in a class by himself, but Phenomenal. but I gotta say, Cena, especially hearing that, yeah, <laughs> Cena being a, a peacemaker is such perfect casting. It really is. 
and and too like he's just like one of the nicest and like most wholesome people like he's out there like donating millions of dollars to help people and like making literally every make a wish come true and like this guy is i love that guy i don't well, care I, i'm a mark for that kind of behavior i love it <laughs> i hear you and and when when they turned him heel i was a little worried because I'm like, this is a good guy, man, and it's and it's very obvious that his good guy real persona. It's like, <laughs> no, not a heel. Sorry, not gonna yeah. happen. Write what you it. want, but that's cool. No, no, oh, pets are welcome. <laughs> pets are welcome. What's the cat's name? This is Chubbs. Uh, he Chubbs. Eight, so he is. Uh, now he needs to cuddle. That's how he. Wants that's it. all good. Absolutely. Um, Oh, no, this is interesting. John Holland wants to know. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with your work, but I am loving your chat. Oh, that's nice, John. Thank, Thank you. you. What would you recommend to someone not familiar with your work to pick up? I definitely want to read some of your stuff. Yeah. Um, if you like horror at all, uh, I would say probably The Wilds or Submerged, um, which is uh, my <laughs> my take on the Orpheus and Eurydice myth, but it is set in the New York City subway system, which is actually hell if you've ever been. <laughs> uh, it's true, especially in well, my summer. <laughs> that's so you know, uh, two things. One, I'm Greek, so I absolutely saw Love and appreciated the <laughs> analogies. No question. That was great. And I got to tell you, every time I've gone to New York, to me, that was part of the adventure, was riding <laughs> riding the subway. And there's a couple people that are like in Brewster and some of the outlying areas and stuff. And I'm like, well, you use the subway, don't you? So I've never been on the subway. I'm like, how can you never have been on the subway? What's you're wrong with something you? If you if you're near New York and you've never been on the subway, you, you will never have a dull time on the subway. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> so yeah, those two. If you like horror, um, if you're not a horror person, uh, I have written some superhero stuff for Valiant. I wrote Livewire. Um, yeah, that was a really fun series. Uh, she's super powerful, and I really love anyone who can control technology with their mind. That's just, a, that's always been such a cool superpower to me. Um, and if you like Xena, then I wrote, you know, I wrote some Xena. Yeah, how much Xena did you end up writing? Six issues. Uh, that's cool. Full arc, like a big chunky book, which was yeah. great. Um, which again, was a blessing. Uh, no spoilers, but uh, it's called Road Warrior, The Trade, uh, cause I take her on a trip around the world. <laughs> that's cool. And rattle off some of your uh, DC and Marvel credits to, so far. Of course. Uh, I wrote uh, an arc of Morbius, the Living Vampire, which came out recently in trade. Uh, I uh, wrote, I'm writing some X-Men that's coming out soon. <laughs> um, for DC, I was blessed enough to co-write an issue of Supergirl with Steve Orlando. I've written some Wonder Woman stuff in various anthologies. Um, what else? <laughs> I did a lot of anthology work for DC. I really like short stories. That was my first love and my first medium, so... I've been telling uh, people like Stephanie Phillips how much I've enjoyed the the summer specials and the Valentine's Day anthology. I don't know if you had anything in that. Uh, no, but I enjoyed it. I really love. Yeah, I love all of that kind of stuff. For me, like I remember as a kid, like reading like books with a bunch of stories in them, and and you get introduced not just to new writers and artists, but also new characters. Like you know, someone goes into the Valentine's Day special because they really love you know, Harley Quinn, but then they come out going, oh, I really love, you know, another Swamp Thing. I don't know. I really love Swamp Thing, but you know what I mean. That's cool. No, that, you know, I, ambitions to write Swamp Thing at some point. <laughs> I wrote a, I wrote a short Swamp Thing story um, that uh, I got to collaborate with Emma Rios and uh, Jordi Belaron. Love, oh. love Emma. She's great. She's amazing. And you've also yeah. contributed, uh, speaking of Emma, I think of Kelly Sue DeConnick. And oh, yes. And you've done some work in uh, Bitch Planet as well, haven't you? Yeah, I was really lucky to be able to have a story in the Bitch Planet anthology, the triple feature. Um, yeah, Kelly Sue is one of my one of my favorite writers of all time, and then also just one of my favorite people in comics. She's truly incredible. I agree. I've known her. I've known her for fifteen years. I always say she and Matt are like my little brother and sister, and they just had their anniversary yesterday. I saw it was so cute. There was a bunch of pictures that they put up of like them and the kids. And I was like, this is what I need. This is when I'm sad. Yeah. This is the content yeah. I need. <laughs> well, and seriously, thank God we've got video. And I'm sure you're doing that with your writing consortiums and everything in terms of connecting. And that's why, honestly, Vita, doing, doing this stuff has been great for me. And it really does kind of feed that social need. So, you know, even though we can't be in the same room and stuff, at least we can talk like this. And yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm experiencing that with every every interview that I do here. 
So and you do you do at least one a day, right? Like you're. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to. I mean, I was like, all right, I'll probably do more. But then I've I've had the pleasant problem of so many people, in addition to my booking my own stuff, going, hey, I really want to come on. And it's oh, like, I, you know, I've got a Kickstarter to promote or I've got, you know, a new thing I want to promote. And it's like, yeah, man, no, that's great. Like I said, I mean, it's this is social hours. So, you know, I again, I have no alcoholic beverages. But uh, <laughs> but no, it's nice. You know, uh, Brian Stelfreeze le- yesterday uh, or no, two days ago, Tom King so last night. Yeah, oh, Brian. That's awesome. You know, yeah. And uh, Rom, Rom V. Got to meet uh, Rom. A huge Rom fan. We're, we're buddies and we, we've known each other for a while. All the white noise guys are, are phenomenal but like oh he's such a joy i just reread these savage shores the other day and i was like this isn't is that great phenomenal. yes i'm a big yeah. vampire person anyway so i was like this is exactly what i need <laughs> i also love his general philosophy too that things like foreign intrigue stories international stories can be reclaimed yes and told in modern terms and we don't have to abandon because really I'm I'm such a fan of the concepts of, and I was saying this to Ron, some a guy like Sailor Costigan, a Robert Howard character. Robert Howard, you know, and a lot of purple pros to say the least, in terms of, you know, yeah, it's like, whoa, really? And again, it was written in the 30s. Right. It's it, a different it, thing. Is what it, it is what it is, unfortunately. But the idea of a merchant marine going around the world and going from port to port. And I don't know if you know that character particularly, I don't. but he's he's a merchant marine boxer. Oh, and, he, yeah, and, and literally, it's just kind of classic foreign intrigue of, okay, now he has to fight the big, you know, strong man of, of the port that he's currently in. That, and, you know, that could be done in a modern, yeah, like, with a modern twist so easily. Like that, that's, I'm already, see, I'm already getting ideas. So no, and, and truly, I, and that's, and then really, it was great to hear Rom kind of say the same thing and pointing out, you know, the, the vampire story of, you know, a, a colonial British vampire going to Nepal. I think, or not Nepal, I forget where he went. Uh, not, um, oh, yeah, he's uh, on the eastern coast of India, right? Like, yeah, uh, yeah. Shame on me. I was told there'd be no geography today. So, it's my worst subject. So. I understand. Rob the Legend uh, ch- chiming in. Oh, that's great, man. Rob is Rob, big wrestling guy. Oh, that's awesome. Been so, weird. yeah. You know, he just interviewed for Mainframe Comic Con that we did in August, uh, Fred the Hammer Williamson. That's and dope. I- how do you, how, See y'all, y'all radio folks and podcasters know know how to do it. Y'all know how to get the hook up. <laughs> I I gotta give it up to my. Uh, you see, I'm the comic book guy. We got three guys, and the other two guys are much more media savvy. And yeah. our guy Chad is a big Chad is a big sports guy, and also very much a wrestling guy. And when uh, when the word came out about uh, about uh, Peacemaker and then Cena, he's like, oh, I, he goes, we gotta get Cena. And it's like, all right, man, we'll see, we'll see. <laughs> You know, I'm not against it, but yeah, I know. I was so I was so envious uh, yeah, that, of, of the conversation weird. with Fred. So, are you are you a big '70s uh, black film uh, fan in terms of that kind of stuff? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, I feel like anything. I sp- I spent a lot of my childhood uh, unsupervised and just watching <laughs> television and stealing cable and watching old Good. television, and like that was like all that kind of stuff. Um, teeny jokes that like if anything any genre thing or anything like that was came out between like the 80s and early 2000s like i know it and i'm like that's i mean earlier too but yes that's right i had nothing awesome. better to do i skipped school i would just watch that stuff instead fantastic uh yeah and rob rob was saying yeah fred was great honestly awesome. rob it's on my channel i i put it, uh, right, I rob's conversation with fred on there because uh rob no, rob knew his career rob knew what to ask him and stuff it was a uh, it was a nice talk so Jessica has another question. What IP or characters are left on your most want to want to write list? That is such a hard question. Um, I yeah, actually we don't want you to spoil. I was, was going to say, say. Well, spoilers, but also it's like, I, I'm lucky enough that like I've written so many that I care about. Like I, like I said, Xena, you know, Wonder Woman, all these incredible characters. Um, and also a lot of the people writing stuff that I would write are my friends. And I'm like, no, nah, I just want them to write it, actually. Uh, but I will say, I always say this, um, and it's true, uh, Renee Montoya. I just, awesome. just give me Renee Montoya, please. That's what I want. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, Have you met Greg? Have you met Rucka? I met him once when uh, I was working at Forbidden Planet, actually. He was signing. <laughs> and he's one of the most delightful people, absolutely. But also, like, 
really firmly aggressive about how, like, it was weird because he, someone asked him a question and he was like, no, we have to do good stories and we have to be right to write my characters. And I was like, yeah, man, <laughs> like, absolutely. Like, get it, go on. <laughs> Yeah, no kidding. He is. He's like a sergeant or a football coach, and he's very he's very committed to his ideas. And I've always loved that. And even before we became friends, I loved seeing him at comic conventions when he would talk about character, and he felt it. And that and it comes yeah, through in his work. It. Exactly. Like I, that's one of the things that I've always loved about him is that when you hear him talk about something, he's not just you know he's not just saying things to say it. Like he loves these characters and he deeply feels for them and when they're his own characters, they're, they're like real people to him. Like, and that's yeah. amazing. That's really Agreed. Incredible. Would you, with writing Renee, would you uh, have her be the question or would you have her uh, be a cop? I mean, how do you see Renee? I would do, so it depends, right? Because I don't like continuity shifts all the time. So I love the question. I loved her as the question, but I also loved Vic as the question, right? Sure. <laughs> like I love, uh, so I think my modern take on her would have to be, post her leaving police, but before she figured out that she wanted to be the question. Like I have a lot of like lead in stuff to that. That's um, cool. And I won't spoil too much, but there is like yeah. two pitches in my mind that I'm like, if I ever get have the chance, I'm doing it. <laughs> oh, that's terrific. Honestly, I, I think that's great. And I, first of all, I do, I like her as the question as well, but I agree with you. I kind of, I really liked her as a Gotham cop. And I also think yeah. that there are a lot of important uh, supporting characters that I need know. to stay civilians. I really, I, yes, absolutely. I love street level stuff. Like I've, uh, especially with DC, like even when they were like superheroes, like I, I'm a Black Canary fan. I, you know, I love Wildcat. Like all, all the people that punch people. For, like, sure. Are, they don't have like necessarily big superpowers because I feel like they actually more often than not don't just beat people up. They find solutions to the problems that are more human. And I really, really love that. And with her, like, one of the only non corrupt cops in the entire city. And like, you know, like when sh her integrity started to, to, to crumble, she was like, I can't be here anymore. And I was like, that is the sign of a good person. Like, I love that. What is that person that desperately wants to help people do when they are no longer a cop? Like, well, how do they do that? That's, that's what really like gets me excited. That sounds great. I also love her complicated relationship <laughs> with Harvey Dent. Yes. It's, it, it's funny because, you know, I feel like everyone who's worked in a job who's had to be with other people all the time has relationships like that. I used to work security. I worked security at the uh, at the Met, the Metropolitan Museum for wow. like about almost four years, not quite four years. And it's like you definitely have those kinds of relationships where you're just like, I love you. But also sometimes, man, <laughs> like sometimes. Yeah. No, I absolutely get it. That's fantastic. Um I'm looking at the questions. I want to. By the way, John, I, I think uh, you sold them on uh, the Wilds. So uh, I hope new, you new did purchase. Um, you know, if you like post-apocalyptic fiction, that's that's where it's at. Um, it's really beautiful, though. We wanted something that was that was not what you would expect, um, and we also wanted to play with the idea of uh, of beautiful and bright things being dangerous <laughs> like in nature often very very like vivid things can be poisonous or venomous so we thought we'd we'd play with those kinds of ideas yeah and also uh and i wanted to confirm this that it, that i was talking about the right book uh you also uh in the five parts had uh, different artists uh yeah. contributing as well so, so talk about that yeah i mean and and uh you know, I'm a I'm a big uh, big fan and friend of uh, Isaac Goodhart, so I'm, I'm oh, glad that. Uh, oops, sorry. There's like a motorcycle coming up. No uh, problem. Yeah, Isaac is one of my favorite human beings on the planet. I adore him so much. I miss him very very much. Um, I so Emily and I were working on the comic, and each issue was going to be longer than your typical comic. Um, for me, that was partially because I just didn't want to be hemmed in by 20 pages and also because you know we're charging like 3.99 an issue i want people to feel like they're getting their full you know their money's worth absolutely um and there was also a little thing where we had five issues instead of six and i wanted to do i wanted people to get to know the characters so that when things happen to them they would care <laughs> um 
And so we figured out, oh, let's do little short stories at the end of each issue, like four page short stories. They'll, yeah. they'll equal a whole issue, right? <laughs> at the end of five. Um, and you'll have the perspective of each character. Um, and Emily, after the first one was like, hey, I can't do 28 pages a month. And I was like, that, that's true. That's great. That, that was bananas. I shouldn't have asked you to do that. <laughs> and uh, she came up with the idea of like, why don't we bring on different people, you know, to help me out. Um, and then we realized we could bring on artists that could reflect the characters that we were trying to do. So, um, you know, I got to work with four other uh, line artists for, for the other four short stories in the, I have it up there. I know. I wanna... Just to block like the mess that's behind me. So I was like, oh, I might as well put up my own books. Uh... <laughs> no, it's all good. There we go. I'm going to zoom in and uh, we can see them all right now. That's okay. Uh, Vita, um, out, of, uh, out of my frame, believe me, I'm Oscar <laughs> Madison. So, uh, believe was, me, the the room in here is is like a nightmare. I just wanted I wanted to keep it clean for y'all. It's all um, good. It's all you know. Uh, one of my uh, buddies in mainframe is like, "Hey, enough with your couch. Can you got good art on the wall? Have that in the background." So that's why I got my uh, commission oh, sketches uh, behind me there. So that's, that's smart. And I'll be I'm going to rotate in and out uh, other other frame things that I've got and everything. So. People can go, oh, that's interesting, you know, whatever. So <laughs> keep it all dynamic behind you, but never mention it, right? You'll just change out things and people. Yeah, well, if somebody it. asks, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll go into detail of who's, who's behind me and everything. But yeah, is it's that the uh, shadow back there. No, that that's is the shadow. Yes, the indeed. Shadow. Yes, from uh, Thomas Gianni. I don't know if you know Gary Gianni, a great '90s and still, still working, a great illustrator. His younger brother Tom did that, and uh, yeah, oh. very much. Uh, I think Storenko, the way the, that Storenko did those shadow covers from those old yeah, '70s paperbacks and stuff. So again, another another character that I love that could use a makeover in terms of I think he's great as this vengeful character, and and also the whole idea of the shadows agents is fascinating, and I would think in today's environment be more interesting because literally, usually he saves their life, and it's like. Okay, now you work for me forever. Yeah, it's what what a racket, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I honestly, I just love you know, those. oh my god, yeah. And I, and again, of uh, agents, men, men, women, uh, of all of all nationalities as well. And and real again, I think an interesting opportunity to show the shadows agents in a modern way. I wonder. I wonder if you do it as vigilantes, or if you do it like if you do it like now. And they're vigilantes, or if you do it as some sort of future thing, and then it's almost like like a ghost in the machine kind of like feel. Interesting. Okay. Don't get me started, John. I'm sorry. I, I 100% will just riff on stories all day, and I know that's probably not what people want to hear. <laughs> no, but that's I, I great. Can go forever. Um, but Feet now tangents are welcome. This is word balloon. <laughs> this is, we we like tangents. That's good. All good. So yeah, yeah, there's nothing's off limits if if you're willing to talk about it. I'm with you, buddy. So it's cool. That's great. Um, I'm already we, thinking. I'll send you an essay later, John. <laughs> <laughs> now, someone asked earlier, and it was confirmed in the chat, and they were concerned if uh, Children of the Atom, it was uh, Elias, wanted to make sure it was still happening. Yes. And then uh, Ryan said, yes, uh, senior editor confirmed. Now, I don't know if Ryan is your editor or he's referring to no, the fact that you're a senior editor. Confirmed. He's referring uh, to Jordan White. Uh, yes, oh, it great. is still happening, and it's happening in January. Uh New Mutants will be, uh, my first issue will be in December, and then uh, Coda will be in, in January, the first issue. That's excellent. And um, and I'm glad for New Mutants, you're working with Rob Rice, I see. And Rob's a, Rob's a good friend. Oh, man. He's incredible. Rod, excuse me. I said Rob. Rod. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I heard the, I heard it right, so I don't okay, know. Okay, good. Maybe, maybe you said I'm thinking right. of Rob the Legend, who's uh, been chiming in on our uh, conversation. But yes, Rod Rice. Sure. Great Brazilian artist. I'm so glad that he was accepted and made the leap from working for the big two as a colorist and now really getting to do what he can do with paint and he just was, beautiful he stuff. He was like born to draw New Mutants. Like I just, I oh, look that's at interesting. It. I look at it, it to me like, I mean, he's his own man and his own artist and it is very recognizable art. But I think about like family trees of artists sometimes and like influences and, and how you can kind of see that. And to me, he reminds me of like Sinkevich and like Noto. Like if they if there was like a Venn diagram of like, you know, and it's like there's Rod right in the middle of like, you know, the like weird but dynamicness of of a Sinkevich and then 
the the like almost candid like have you seen Full Noto's like candid superhero series? Like almost like that feeling to his art as well, and just the two blended is that's perfect. very interesting. And I and I know Bill and uh, Phil quite well, and I never really made that connection with Rod's art, but I can totally see that. And I think you're right; there is a through line. That's pretty it's cool, incredible. And he's also just I I, I almost want to just what I script. I want to be like I don't know what do you want to do? Just do it. Just whatever you want. I don't <laughs> I don't because uh, he shouldn't have to do my job for me, but. I make it very clear in the scripts. I'm like, you can literally ignore everything and just, this is the feel, man. <laughs> like, you can ignore my descriptions and my breakdowns and stuff. Now, as you come on these books, these X books, you're coming out of an event. Are they going to breathe and be able to be their own thing for a while? Or is there an immediate? Definitely. Okay, good. Good to hear. Yeah, it's, it's really nice. The new kind of like paradigm for the X books and, and the way that the X room, I've actually been working with all the other X writers for over a year now. <laughs> like we've been uh, probably a year and a half now. Wow. Um, so I, I have a very intimate knowledge of all the, you know, all the workings, but the way that things work now, it's uh, all the books are going to have enough time to establish themselves. And then maybe there's a crossover. And then also, you know, the books touch on each other um, all the time, but you don't have to read them all, which I really like. So like Lee Williams and Teeny Howard are doing things where like, you know, if you're reading both of their books, you go, oh, you guys talked about this. <laughs> like you guys, you planned this. Um, but if you just read one, then it's, it, you know, it's great. Um, so you're, you're allowed as much runway as you need to just develop your own voice and develop your own kind of like cadence for whatever the book is with your, with your collaborator, with your artist, which is great. Excellent. Who uh, who's uh, on your New Mutants team? Oh, uh, I wanted as many of the uh, uh, my favorites as possible. Um, I could never everyone, but uh, Magic, Danny Moonstar, of course. She's my number one <laughs> New Mutant. She's she's the best. Uh, Wolfsbane, uh, Warpath, Warlock, and Scout. <laughs> oh, and Karma, of course, Karma. Cool. Um, so yeah. A lot of the classics and then uh, some, you know, midpoint and then a newer. I love Scout. I love That's Scout. awesome. I haven't seen the movie yet. How is it? I haven't had a chance to see it. I, okay. We're not going outside for anything but essential. No, right I hear now. you. Um, and so I'm, when it comes to streaming, I will happily check it out. I so is it, I, I thought it was, both. maybe I, maybe I misunderstood. Maybe it isn't available yet as a streamer. I, I, I don't know. Oh, I, don't know. I, I hadn't seen it available yet. I'll definitely check it out if it is, um, but I hadn't seen it. Well, and it's so weird because once COVID hit, I'm like, all right, I'll, I'm sure I'll catch these movies when they're streaming. Yeah. And yet I haven't seen uh, Bloodshot yet. I haven't seen I haven't seen Birds of Prey yet. I'll admit that. The it's, Harley so Quinn book. Is it's so it? good. Is it? It's uh, super, super fun. And also okay. uh, it's one of those movies where you don't really expect it to be 100% um, faithful to the source material. I'm a big Birds of Prey fan. Like from Me too. Classic from Birds of Prey. Absolutely. Like, like, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I know. Um, I read a ton of Chuck stuff and truly I loved what Julie and Shauna did when they were, when they were yes, writing the birds too, for that matter. All the way through Birds of Prey has been a blessed book to me. Like it's absolutely incredible. Um, but so it's, it's one of those things where it's like, we're going to get at the core of some of the characters and make it more modern. That's what we're going to do. And we're also going to do it from the perspective of a very unreliable narrator, which I think people forget. Like people are like, oh, it's just a movie. And I don't understand why this person is doing this. And I'm like, you're getting the story from Harley Quinn. She's telling you the story. She's not reliable. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a lot of fun. And seeing Rosie Perez as Renee Montoya was a gift. Truly. That's really cool. I, I didn't put two and two together. I didn't realize that Rosie's playing Renee. I can totally see that. That's great. Oh, she's great at it. <laughs> That's outstanding. Another big boxing fan, by the way. Would love to sit down uh, and talk to Rosie Perez about boxing someday because I know I'll how much of a fan she is. Second, let me tell you. <laughs> she's great. She's been on like Teddy Atlas, the, the fight trainer. She's been on his podcast. And yeah, she's like, no, she, know, she knows her stuff, which is awesome. You know, it's like her and Joyce Car Carol Oates are the two women that come to mind that it's like, I would love to have a boxing conversation with these women. They're, they're I incredible. I did not know that about Joyce Carol. <laughs> oh yeah. She was, really you know, she's kind of one of those, like my dad took me to fights when I was a little kid. So lifelong boxing fan. I know. Isn't that great that somebody's so literate <laughs> and stuff. Well, and that's the weird thing about boxing. There are like 
uh, Plim George Plimpton and um, oh god, now what's his face? Naked in the Dead, New York. Um, damn it. Um, I, I see him in my head, and I, there was going to be a test. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry, buddy. This is like one of those great art writers from the 50s, Norman Mailer. Norman Mailer. Yes. So Norman Mailer, big fight fan. You know, I mean, all these interesting, that like literati. Me, actually, Norman doesn't... Mailer as a fight fan, that doesn't surprise me at all. Well, that's true, actually. Yes, he is. <laughs> he was always ready to get into a fight with somebody at the drop of a hat. That's absolutely true. But that's why, honestly, um, I love that period of boxing anyway. And then also that great liter literary period of the 50s and 60s. And it's like all these guys were big fight fans. I mean, I got to know Bud Schulberg before he passed away and got to hang out with him a few times. And, you know, the man who wrote, I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody wrote on the waterfront, wrote Bogart's last uh, movie, <laughs> harder they fall, you know? And I mean, yeah, this guy was just, you know, embodiment of just great noir boxing and stories and stuff. And uh, yeah, it was a pleasure You're to get just to know him. Rubbing elbows, just having a good time. <laughs> you know, on, Hey, I'm 55, you know, I've, I've been between broadcasting and, and writing, I was able to meet a lot of interesting people. So yeah, I'm, I'm very, I'm very lucky that way. I'm, I'm Forrest Gump. I mean, I'm literally foot soldier of history, just kind of in pictures, the background. All the pictures in the background. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love that. I absolutely love that. Dawn, regarding uh, what you're reading, good question. And Dawn, new uh, newcomer. Thank you for watching, Dawn. Always curious what writers are reading. What's on your current poll list? That is a very good question. Uh, I have for comics. I've been reading Wicked Things. Uh, which is so good. Um, I don't know if you're a John Allison fan, but uh, real good. I even have them like literally sitting over there. Um, awesome. So good. Uh, I've been reading uh, a bunch of homework. So a bunch of X-Men books. Uh, <laughs> sure. I've been consumed with all of the Dawn of X books, which is a, a joy. Um, I've been reading a lot of like novels lately, actually, yeah. just to reward myself because I love comics. I will always love comics, but it has become a little bit more work. And so I'm like, oh, I need a palette cleanser. So I'm rereading a bunch of Octavia Butler stuff right now. Cool. I just reread the uh, Xenogenesis saga, Dawn and Adulthood Rights and Imago. Phenomenal. If you're a sci-fi like space fan, I really do suggest it. If you like weird sci-fi and aliens and semi-body horror, super, super good. Um, yeah, what else am I reading? I'm always reading Hellboy, so I've been rereading Hellboy. <laughs> it's Nothing like one of my that. favorite comics of all time. Um, it's just, I have a Hellboy tattoo. Like, just... Wow, that's great. <laughs> that's great. I was walking through Artist Alley. Uh, I don't know if you can see. Hold on, I'll right, zoom, right I'll zoom in. Death. <laughs> or right nice. hand zoom, rather, not death. Um, but I was you. walking through Artist Alley when it was like fresh, so I had to like keep it out. And I walked by Mike's table and he was like, oh. That's so cool. And I was like, I can't look at you. I can't talk to you. You're too cool. I've got to go. Excuse me. And I just like rolled away. Uh, but yeah, I almost got the right hand to doom on my left arm just, just to be cheeky. <laughs> but I was like, I can't do that. I can't live with that. <laughs> that's, outstanding. that's great. Now, you know, and again, speaking of Hellboy and, and Mike, uh, that story that he did with Gary Gianni a couple of years ago was just amazing. <sighs> And I and that's why I mean Gary, it's like every couple of years because like he'll do a lot of spot illustration for for novels and things, so we don't get a new comic book from him. And he's like, "Oh yeah, John, I uh, just did this Hellboy that I've been working on forever. Can we talk about it?" I'm like, "Yes, Gary, of course yeah, we please can." Please and thank you. Yeah. Hellboy is also just like such a joy, and and BPRD, I love I love BPRD as well because you do have like you there's mics all over it, but also like there are all these other people that come in and get to like play with that world and it's such a rich and wonderful world i agree john accordy i think you know knows oh what he's doing God. when he writes that stuff i'm so, uh i'm a big lobster johnson fan i think of the whole hellboy pantheon i uh, that's yes. that's my favorite character because i am a, i'm an old like as you can tell from having the shadow on my wall and the, the things we've been talking about i am I, I really do appreciate the ideas of classic pulp and same. i do think that it's you know there's a lot of interesting ground to cover potentially I agree. So. I, I was talking about this with a very good friend of mine, Jamie Jones, who is a cartoonist. Uh, we work together, hopefully more than once, uh, a few times, but uh, I co-wrote a book called Quarter Killer with Danny Lohr and Jamie, um, Jamie Drew and colored it and also was involved in the story. Um, but he's a big, like, old school pulp fan, like huge. Um, 
And he, you know, we have conversations all the time and he's always like, I just, there's ways to bring it forward and we can, we can, you know, just take the stuff that's good and then just like, just, just, just get rid of the bad stuff. And I'm yeah. like, I, I feel like. I feel like that's that's his calling. He's doing this book called The Baboon, which is okay. phenomenal. And it's just that kind of like it's a very like pulp action-y like hero kind of guy, but there's like a team and it's it's everything that you love about it without the like the stuff that has not aged as well. It, it no yes, to put it delicately, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I get it because I, you know, I too loved John Carter of Mars as a child and like all of these things and now I'm like Ooh, let's 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 uh the, the adventure's good. That's cool. Having adventures is cool. You know, I also yeah. was like a big Jonah Hex fan, and I'm like, I know, I know, <laughs> I know. Yeah, and you know, it's it's funny. Last night, uh, or no, not last night. I guess yes, it was with uh, with Brian with Stelfries. Uh, big Jonah Hex fan came in and was talking about Brian's issue with that, and I really loved what uh, Palmiati and Justin Gray did. Yes, with yeah. that run, and it's such mm -hmm. a great. I mean, it, it was it was such a pleasure because yeah, man. I, again, the Western, I think, you know, and and I, I I haven't been paying attention to a lot of modern westerns. I saw Bone Tomahawk a couple of years ago. I, I remember seen seeing that. that. Uh, but yeah, I um, again, I think there's an opportunity to reclaim those stories and tell right. very interesting stories with a modern perspective and and treat everybody with respect. And then every now and then there are. Uh, uh, Tom King and I were talking last night about Fort Apache, the John Wayne, Henry Fonda movie. And really John Wayne of all people in that movie is saying, Hey, you know, the native Americans know what they're doing and they're, they're not the bad guys here. They're good people. And we, you know, let's not attack them. And it's like John Wayne of all people. playing. I know. Role. I mean, to, to hear it from his lips is so confusing. <laughs> it's, it's interesting too, because one of the things I'm really, I am a huge Western fan. Like I just love Western movies and samurai movies like are like two of the things that I love and they, they inform each other. Um, pulp is amazing. By the way, I see that scrolling on the bottom. I read it in one sitting. I could not put it down. It was phenomenal. Me too. Um, I talked to Ed about that. It was amazing. Absolutely. It's so, so, so. Good. Well, well, that's interesting. That and that, and oh. Rob's telling us that Lone Ranger is actually good on Dyna by dynamite right now. I don't remember who wrote that, but I remember really enjoying it too. Lone Ranger is an interesting one, right? All of these like old Western ideas that we have, I find them interesting, you know, trying to modernize that kind of stuff because being truer to the actual like things that happened, it would look much more modern than what you would think, right? Like cowboys were mostly brown. <laughs> like yeah, they, were, yeah. they were mostly brown people. They were black people and, you know, like what we would call Latinx people now. And, you know, there was... Okay please indigenous Americans everywhere. Right. Right. And it's like, if, you know, I'm always interested in, in thinking how you can bring it forward, but then I'm like, Oh, just tell the truth. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. We found it. We found the, we've, we've unlocked the secret. Just tell the truth. Did you like uh, the Banderas Zorro movies? I did. I Me know too. I did. Me too. I love them. I also yeah. had a huge crush on Catherine Zeta Jones. So I was like, this is I'm with you. Antonio is a phenomenal Zorro. So I was like, Oh, sure. <laughs> Can't go wrong. I cannot go wrong. No, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm totally with you. That's true. And Henry also acknowledges again Emma and uh, and Kel Kelly Sue with uh, Pretty Deadly. One Great of my stuff. favorite comics of all time. Um, that to be able to work with Emma uh, and also with Kelly Sue actually was almost too much for my little heart because Pretty Deadly changed the way I thought about comics at the time. Um, it. Absolutely. If I had the if I had the money and not a pandemic right now, I would go get a pretty deadly tattoo. <laughs> That's cool. Now we mentioned it earlier, but we really didn't get into it. Uh, what can you tell us about Children of the Atom? Yeah, I'm so sorry. Uh, well, not I, at all. I'm all over the place at all times. No, 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 no. This is awesome. <laughs> We're doing good. I. What can I tell you about Children of the Atom? So, Children of the Atom is a team book and a teen book. They're they're youngins uh, in their their early to mid teens uh, and they are basically us. Like imagine if there was a group of like X-Men who grew up loving the X-Men because you know, we, we are so used to these X-Men stories where the, the public hates them like for yeah. whatever reason, which there are always a lot of reasons, right? But like, I feel like contemporary kids would be like, nah, that's so cool. <laughs> Look at them. They have superpowers and they're saving people. That's lit, son. And so I feel like 
that is the perspective of the book. All of these kids got together and they're like, okay, but there are heroes, not in the way that the Avengers are people's heroes, but like we a hundred percent are sold. X-Men are awesome. And we're going to do, you know, we're going to be the next X-Men. And so it's kind of about, you know, kids trying to figure out their own identities while kind of trying on the identities of like the people that they admire. And then also finding out that they are great the way that they are. Um, it's about, you know, friendships and about getting into trouble when you really should be home or in school, but you're off trying to superhero, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Gotcha. Um, it's a lot of fun. It was one of the things that I really wanted to do with the books when I came onto the Xboxes, answer questions that I had about what was going on and also just have a lot of fun. So the Children of the Atom um, book is also from the fan fan perspective and from a group of kids who is not able to go to Krakoa. They are stuck, you know, because they got homework to do. They're not allowed to. <laughs> it don't matter if you're a mutant or not. You got homework to do. You got homework to do. That's just how it is. Uh, that's that's great. I remember when Casada was doing, and I forget who the artist was. Generation was it Generation X? Gen X, yeah, yeah, wasn't it? Like in the early two thousands, I thought that's what it was called. Yeah, and yeah, it, and you know, and it kind of was the same thing. It was you know you know uh, uh, kids in the city kind of dealing with. I I, I don't remember if they had that. Uh, hero worship thing for the X-Men. But no, uh, what you're saying makes sense. And it, I think it is a good opportunity to examine the classic heroes from a different perspective and also introduce new characters in the process. Right. And one of the questions I had too, going into all the X stuff, reading Hox Pox and, and just in the room was like, well, what about people who can't just abandon everything and go hang out on cool mutant island? Like there are some people that can't do that. Like for whatever, you know, everyone has their own reasons for why they do what they do. Like, yeah. but like some people like, like if I was suddenly like a mutant, I don't know if I would go live on Mutant Island. Like my parents are human and, you know, like my cat's here and like my wife's here, like all this kind of stuff. So it's like, what is it, what is it like when you're trying, you know, you have all these different parts of your identity, but you're trying to do what you do. Um, and they were like, go have fun, run with that. All right, great. <laughs> That's cool. And now, yeah, Mario, maybe you're right. Maybe with Generation Next, maybe that's what it was called. But Is I do next? that. Not, not X? Oh, my God. I can't. Yeah, exactly. I, I was told there'd be no math today. I don't remember. I don't remember. But uh, you know what? We have to we have to do one of those charts of like, all right, what was every like the new crime? decade? Yeah. just like, yeah, every five years or so, there's a new it's like next and then NYX and then also. It was um, NYX. Was it it was NYX. NYX. Yes, that's what it was. Yes, well oh, done. No, that. you're right. And truly, Vita, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm I'm not usually the biggest X Men fan, but it's usually somebody that comes in and does something different that I'm like, oh, now sign me up. <laughs> and that's why Hickman is fascinating. Um, I I felt that way. I felt that way when uh, Brew Baker and uh, Fraction were writing the book, you know, in the early 2000s. So no, I I, I hear you absolutely. I'm a big like Brubaker Mark as well. So I'll just read whatever he does. Like <laughs> he could he could just be writing the TV guide. I'd be like, all right, let's do it. <laughs> let's read it. Well, he told me years ago his retirement plan was to write jughead stories for Archie. Um, and he's like he's like nothing would so make me happy. <laughs> he would be so good at that. I'd read it. And then Sean Phillips would would illustrate it. It'd be that be well that's why too <laughs> they had that one arc of criminal that essentially was like Noir Archie, and I thought it was so fantastic. So, no, I know what you mean. And I'm totally with you on Pulp. You know, taking Ed's cues from what Ed's doing, because Ed is really, you know, now he's doing graphic novels first. Uh, he's playing around with Marcos Martin and Panel Syndicate and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Have you have you thought about the other platforms beyond the direct market, and especially when there was that Pencils Down period? I don't know if that affected definitely. you. Oh, it did, definitely. Um I was lucky enough in that the companies that I was working for by and large tried to find me smaller projects to keep me afloat <laughs> while they could figure stuff out, which I'm, I'm very lucky. Uh, sure. But I did lose a lot of stuff in that. Um, but that's just, that's just how it is. Um, I would love to do, I love looking at all the different kinds of ways that you can make comics. I think that comics are one of the most versatile mediums that we have, as long as you're able to engage with media visually, then you can engage with comics, which I think is really great. 
Um, and right now we are living in kind of a golden age of access where there are as many ways to get comics as there are comics. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and you can make, as long as you have access to the internet or a library with the internet, you can make your own comics and put them online. So like, I'm always fascinated with things like web comics, things like, you know, uh, you know OGNs. I'm a big OGN fan um, because I'm a, I'm a big reader. And so I like having yeah. a big chunky book. Yeah. Um, or I love the idea behind Panel Syndicate. I think it is genius. I have a little trouble reading digitally. I still do it, but like I prefer like physical. But like the idea of being able to play with that format is so fascinating to me. And I know that most people don't have the same kind of like issues with taking in digital. Um, so yeah, I if I had the if I had the resources in order to be able to really experiment, I would definitely do that. Um, I'm lucky enough too that I have I have an agent. And we are great. Like into the book market stuff, which I'm super, super excited to to try and break into as well. Um, so yeah, I, I as many different ways as you can get media, I'm super into. I want to do a fiction podcast. I want to write, you know, more screenplays. I want to do all kinds of stuff. <laughs> That's outstanding. I uh, I have my own plans for uh, a narrative uh, podcast, and I'm not sure if I want to do straight up documentary or turn it into fiction. I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, I, I creative nonfiction, right? You can do both. You can have. Well, both. that's true too. Yeah, you know, I don't know, and I'll even tell you because it's something I've been talking about, and I want to keep myself honest that I will pursue it. It's that period of boxing uh, after Joe Lewis and before Ali, when the mob really had a stranglehold on boxing, and it was the early days of television. All this stuff is real, uh, and I mean, Sugar Ray Robinson stopped boxing. And wanted to really pursue tap dancing and do an entertainment career. And it was in the early 50s when tap dancing was on its way out as a real possible career. So he had to go back and had to fight. And all of a sudden, when he got back, he wasn't an independent agent that could claim 50000 for a fight. He'd have to fight for 5000 a fight. And it, there's this really sad newsreel footage of him when he won back the middleweight title. And he's in his dressing room crying. And the commentators are like, oh, wow, isn't this like an amazing moment? He's so like sentimental about winning the title back. And it's like, no, he knows he's screwed and it's making 10 cents on the dollar when he used to make a whole dollar. And he's got no choice because these guys are running the game now. And he never had to you know, throw a fight or anything stupid like that. And he was ridiculously talented even into his late 30s and into his early 40s. But – that was the reality, and he had no choice. There was no, there was nothing else he could do if he wanted to pursue the middleweight title, and that was the most money he could make. So, yeah, it's those kind of hard realities that I think is really John, a fascinating. You got to do this. You got to write this. Like this seems yeah, so yeah. interesting, and also, I mean, heartbreaking, <laughs> I, but also like, what a rich period of time. Yeah, to, to be able to examine. I don't think I've I, I don't know a lot of stories from that time i think that there's definitely a need for that well that's why you know i mean marcy and even you know and it truly was happening to fighters of all colors white black hispanic it didn't matter um and i don't know enough about the asian fighters of the period and i want to really kind of that's the thing i, I want to get it right excuse you know me what i mean though, right <laughs> oh absolutely no you know and and truly uh i, I have a subscription to newspapers.com so i can really go to the the papers of the day and really see how the writers then were, were dealing with it. Cause also before television, you could have a lot of hometown decisions mm -hmm. and that was something fighters always had to deal with. And then all of a sudden with the scrutiny of television, they were still trying to play the game, but all of a sudden they had millions of viewers going, uh, that's a lousy decision or that guy's not giving a full effort yeah. and it's clearly throwing the fight in some way. So it's really, really interesting that it was this convergence of mass media happening in the late 40s, literally as Joe Lewis was retiring. And then this very weird period. And like Sonny Liston was like the last heavyweight champion that was controlled by the by the gangsters. And then uh, when Floyd Patterson uh, won the, well, actually Floyd was before him. It was after Marciano, then Floyd came in. And then when Ali won, no, Ali was, hey, Ali was his own man. They yeah. were afraid of, of, of the Muslim, the black Muslim movement behind him as well. And things change. And also the government, uh, you know, the congressional hearings against boxing and, and finally outing the gangsters and proving that, no, there's fixed stuff going on. So, yeah, it's a cool story. No, I'll get to it. <laughs> you got to do it. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Absolutely. No, I will. I definitely will. Um, 
Oh, here you go. Yeah, John, make that nonfiction a nonfiction podcast. That would be great even for a non-boxing fan. I would be interested. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it does. It's got all this real serious drama in it that that a lot of uh, different factors. So, no, I appreciate Vita and John agreeing and, and seeing the value in that. So, thank you. That's awesome, man. Oh, that's nice. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> Warren Drummond, a fantastic uh, uh, storyboard artist in, in the world of uh, pictures. And yeah, he's like uh, Sonny Liston with Mob Ties. Yes, and Sugar Ray. Yeah, best pound for pound. Yeah, even Ali said Ray Robinson was faster than he was. Mm -hmm. So yeah, cool stuff. Well, there you go, Vita. I like it. Um, hey, congratulations. Seriously, I'm really glad everything's going well for you, and I hope you'll stay in touch. And um, yeah, absolutely. No, and you're and you're very kind to to say you like the show. That that means a lot. Seriously, I listen every day. <laughs> well, that's terrific because you know I'm I'm a, I'm, a, I'm an old I'm an old dude. And it's like to, it's nice to know that young people, young people <laughs> like yourself. If I could be very old, I'm not oh that my old. gosh, oh my gosh, please! <laughs> I have siblings your age. Come on, <laughs> do you really? That's cool. All right, fair enough. That's awesome. Good deal. <laughs> that makes me that that comforts me a little bit knowing that and stuff. No, seriously, it's been a pleasure talking to you more. And uh, hang out for a second as I wrap up, because sure, sure. Uh, I want to uh, I want to uh, shoot something by you and, and see if you'd be interested in doing it. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. VDIL, everybody. How about that? Terrific story. Listen, but as I wrap up, I'll tell you who's on the wall. So up there on top, that snake Pliskin that was done by Tone Rodriguez. Underneath, we got a silk screen of Daredevil by David Mack. Alex Saviak did that great Green Lantern. It's a Hal Jordan Green Lantern. That's a classic Nick Fury done by the great Bill Reinhold. And as we mentioned earlier, The Shadow by Thomas Gianni. And expect uh, rotations in that uh, art uh, selection behind me in uh, future uh, podcasts. Thanks a lot for watching Word Balloon Live. Tomorrow it's um, To the Outer Limits Late Night with Gabe Hardman. And, uh, of course, we'll uh, talk Star Trek and do a Lower Decks uh, review in the late afternoon. Until then, 